So one of the comments that I'm getting quite a bit is that people have noticed that I recommend Sandef from the Syrian and his poems, the Hymns of Paradise, <clears throat> to, to read that in order to understand the story in Genesis and also the symbolic structure. And many people have written me to... Uh, say that they're not they're struggling to get out of St. Ephraim what I suggest they can get. And so last month I was invited by Father Jason Foster to Shreveport, Louisiana to speak um, at a clergy retreat for the Orthodox Church, the OCA, Orthodox Church of America, but also to uh, give two public um, two public speaking events at his parish. And so what you're going to see is the first part of that. I'll post the second part in a few weeks. But the first part was really diving into the poem of St. Ephraim. Also connecting that poem with uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa and his vision of the ascent of the mountain. And so what we're really getting is this image of the mountain of paradise as this cosmic structure. And so hopefully this will help people get through St. Ephraim and uh, get the gold nuggets that are found in his poem. I would especially recommend that people, uh, a lot of the good stuff came out in the question period because it was the first time I was presenting, trying to present these things uh, systematically. A lot of the stuff ended up coming out in the question period. So please, if you can, uh, take the time to, uh, to um, get through that as well. The questions are difficult to understand, but what I when they are, I put up the question as, uh, as text over the image. And so if you are listening to it audio, maybe take a glance at the screen to see the question if you want to follow that as well. So please enjoy my first dive into Sandy from the Syrian, and I uh, hope you enjoy that. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. So tonight what I want to talk about is, I want to talk to you a little bit about that experience that I had or try to take you along that experience that I had of seeing how everything is connected together, to see how the Bible and our Tradition of the fathers, the icons, all of this is really a powerful series of embedded patterns, you could call it. I, the way I, I sometimes try to describe it is that it, reality has a fractal structure. Everybody knows what a fractal is. So a fractal is like a tree. <clears throat> if you look at a tree, you have the basic tree, but then each branch of the tree has the same shape as the tree. Right? So you have a tree, and then the branch, and on, if you follow the branch, if you could cut the branch off and hold it, it would look just like a tree. If you cut a smaller branch off, it would also look like a tree. Because the pattern is the basic pattern, but then at every level of the tree, it's the same pattern which reappears. And that's what, when you start to look at the way that the fathers were interpreting scripture, and the way that then they use that and they, they use that to form our liturgy, to form our icons, to form uh, the way that they talked about scripture, that that's what they're diving into. They're diving into that pattern. And so when a father will add some, will, will go through some of, the, some of the details, when a father will add some little detail in the text, it looks like he's making up some detail in the biblical text, some tradition, but he's not. He's, he's, he's able to say that because he's noticed that there's all these patterns come together and the elements are there in, in each one. So this is very abstract for now. I'm going to take you on the trip. So hopefully you will, you, will, uh, you will see what I'm talking about. So first of all, we have this idea, this embedded idea of patterns. You could call it the fathers, St. Maximus, the confessor especially, talks about it as macrocosm and microcosm. So there's a cosmic structure and then there's a personal structure, the human being is microcosm, and then you have this massive uh, universe which has the same shape as the human person. Um, so St. Maximus goes very far in this. He says, the entire cosmos consisting of the visible and invisible things is man. And man consisting of body and soul is cosmos. For the intelligible things participate to the substance of the soul 
as the soul has the same reason as the intelligible ones. That's a little more complicated. Stick, keep the first quote part, but I'm still going to go through it. And the sensible things bear the image of the body as the body is the image of the sensible things. So we have in the created world, there are invisible things, there are principalities, there are the angels, there are things that hold, let's say, hold the world together. And then we have sensible things. And in the person, we also have an invisible aspect to us. We have the soul, we have the noose, we have, we have even have our, our desires, which are invisible. And then there's the body, there's the, the physical part. Right? And those two are, they're the same structure. So because they're the same structure, St. Maximus sees creation as being built for man. Because man ends up being the thing that holds the whole thing together. Like, this, like an anchor that has, just like the universe, has a, a physical aspect, an invisible spiritual aspect, and then kind of brings it all together. Um, so St. Maximus talks about how the man is a, he, he talks about him as being a, a laboratory in which because the human being pulls all those elements together, right? We have our thoughts, we have our bodies, we have all these elements to us and we pull them together into one being. And then the human being does that also for creation itself. And so, it's interesting. It's interesting to think about that. It's interesting to think about that today. Because we're, we're reaching, we've gone through this time in history where we've had this kind of scientific materialism. And, we've, we, and the Christians have been slapped around by a lot of that, that thinking where we have this idea that there's the world, and the world has these rules, and we just have to look at them and we can measure and we can, we can calculate. And then we can just say, you know, here how, here's how it works. We figured it out. But we're coming to, we're coming to the end of that. And even a lot of uh, scientists, a lot of physicists are coming to the end of that where they realize once we've reduced everything to, to the material world, once we've done that, we have a problem. Because then you have to explain the spiritual stuff. So how do you, because before that, they could kind of ignore it. You know, this is stupid. This is just stupid stuff. Let's not talk about that. We're just going to talk about this material stuff. Then you reach the end of it. You're like, okay, we, we, we can encompass everything in this material stuff. We've encompassed everything. And then at some point you're like, okay, well then let's take that stuff, that spiritual stuff, like consciousness, like human experience, like identities, like qualities of things. How do you now fit that into your material world? And they're struggling to do it. So they come up with words like emergence, right? How, how is it, why is it that we know that something has parts, but it's also one thing at the same time? You ever thought about that? Right, you look at a chair, the chair has parts, right? It has different parts, different elements, different, you know. Why do we think that that's one thing? Why do we say it's a chair? Why don't we just see the parts? And why don't we just see the parts all the way down? Because those parts go all the way down in the scientific world, all the way down to this, to the quantum whatever, quantum field of particles that are just floating around. So then they, they stack up. They stack up towards these different stages of unity. And then in the human experience, we, we, we see it even more. You know, like, why do we think that this here, people coming here, why do we think that that's one thing? Why do we think that the United States of America is one thing? How do we get to that? Right? And so in the vision of St. Maximus, St. Maximus gives us a key. St. Maximus gives us a key is that the human person, a, a modern way of, of saying that would be something like consciousness. Right? Fathers don't use that word. But it's a, it's a good word to use because people understand what it means today. People know. A lot of the other words like soul, you say use the word soul today, you're, people just they have all these ideas of what it means. Like just try, to, try to find words that actually have meaning for people today. So you say you say. Through, we need consciousness, or consciousness plays a part in bringing things together, in making things one, right? You need a conscious agent to be able to say that chair is a bunch of stuff, but it's also one thing, that jump into, into unity. And that's how St. Maximus talks about us. That's what we do, that's what we are. That's what, that's what makes us special. 
in creation. That's what makes us not only special, that's what makes us in the image of God. All right, so that's this idea of this macrocosm, microcosm, right? And how relevant it is to understand today. One of the words that the physicists are using today, they, they, they have a fancy theory, they call it the anthropic principle. Because they're realizing that anthropic means the shape, like the shape of, of man. They're reali realizing that it's so complicated, everything is so complicated, that you almost need the world to be made in a way to give consciousness, to bring consciousness about. Because consciousness is, they're not able to explain it. They can't explain consciousness. Like they can't explain the thing by which they're looking at the world with. So it comes very, very. And then that's when people like Sam Maximus can help us get a key to something more. All right. So a lot of you like me come from kind of Bible believing churches, the, 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 the kind of Protestant evangelical world. Um, and so what I discovered in reading the Church Fathers, and today I'm going to take you mostly through a Church Father whose name is St. Ephraim the Syrian. St. Ephraim the Syrian is a, uh, a Semite. He's, a, he's an Ara Aramea Aramaic saint who probably spoke Aramaic. Uh, he probably actually did, I don't know, it wasn't Aramaic. He spoke the early Syriac language, I would think. I think his texts are written in Syriac. Um, and so he does this powerful uh, interpretation of the Garden of Eden and of, of Genesis. He has a text called the Hymns on Paradise, and it's a poem. It's a poem that talks about paradise. But the way that he talks about paradise is so powerful because it does exactly what I'm talking to you about. It shows us this pattern that is there. It basically lays the garden of Eden out as the pattern of everything. All the way until we understand that it's also the pattern of the heart of the human person. All right. So first off, I want to show you how big, how big St. Ephraim makes the paradise. He says, and he had a vision, like he, for him, he had this, this vision of paradise. And he says, with the eye of my mind, I gazed upon paradise. The summit of every mountain is lower than its summit. Okay, so it's the highest mountain. And then he talks about how the crest of the flood of Noah reached to the foothills of paradise. But it didn't enter into paradise. And so paradise ended up being above the flood. Okay. Now you also have to remember that paradise is a mountain, right? That's, not, that's actually in the Bible. People forget that it's in the Bible. It's not in Genesis, it's in Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel gives this description of paradise, and he says, he talks about the paradise as, the, as this holy mountain, as this, this mountain. So you have to imagine this mountain. Now I'm already going to give you the image. And so he has this idea of this paradise as a mountain. At the summit of the mountain is the tree of life, okay? And let's say above the tree of life or coming down upon the tree of life is the glory of God. Just like the glory of God descended onto the Ark of the Covenant, he, has, he, just, he talks about how the glory, or that the glory of God descended to encounter Moses on the Mount Sinai, so too the glory of God is at the summit of the mountain and we have the tree of life. So he talks about how the limits of the garden, so imagine that, so the summit of the garden is higher than all the mountains. And the limit of the garden is beyond all the ocean. So you imagine the way that the ancient people saw the world. Basically this giant island surrounded by Oceanus, by the infinite ocean. Which is still true today. There still is this ocean that kind of surrounds everything. You know, that's all connected together that kind of flows around everything. Um, and so he saw the paradise as uh, the limits of paradise being beyond the ocean. Here's a description that he, that he talks about. He says, Moses made a crown for that resplendent altar with the wreath entirely of gold that he crowned the altar in its beauty. Right? So around the altar 
in the, the tabernacle, there was this, this golden braid or this golden crown which went around the altar. And so he says, thus gloriously intertwined is the wreath of paradise that encir- encircles the whole of creation. So the crown of paradise, the wreath of paradise, encircles all of creation. So its summit is beyond the highest mountain, and its limit is beyond all of creation. So, so already we're, try, we're starting to see that the, the place that he's talking about is maybe not the same kind of place that we're used to thinking about in our kind of very materialistic world, let's say. That he is talking about a place, but this place is, is uh, let's say it's the place of places, you could call it, right? It's the it's that which makes place possible. Something like that. That's maybe a way to, to, to describe it. Um, and so this mountain is also a hierarchy. It's a, it's a hierarchy of beings. Or hierarchy of being itself. So here are some descriptions that he gives. He says, when he made this intricate design, he varied its beauties. So that some levels were far more glorious than others. To the degree that one level is higher than another, so too is its glory the more sublime. In, the, in this way, he allots the foothills and the most lowly, the slopes to those in between and the heights to the exalted. So that which is exalted, that which is high, that which is glorious is higher up on this mountain, and that which is confused or in between or is lower is lower on the mountain all right so hopefully things are starting to take shape in understanding what he's talking about so then saint saint Ephraim talks about the four rivers of paradise so we know that in the garden there were four rivers of paradise now if you if you think of the paradise as a mountain all of a sudden, the image of the four rivers will change as well. Because it's hard, you can't really see it otherwise as these four rivers that are coming down the mountain. Right? So you can kind of imagine, I mean, you don't have to think about it too much, but like a source, there's a source, some kind of source that is pushing the water and then it's coming down, coming down the mountain. So he talks about how its fountains delight with their fragrance. But when they issue forth towards us, they become impoverished in our country, since they put on the savors of our land as we drink them. So he has this idea that the, 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 the waters of the rivers of paradise water all of creation. They are the source of all the waters. We always have to remember when we look at in the Bible, when it talks about water, Flowing water always comes from above. It has to. It has to come from above. There's no other way for it to be flowing. And so it, it, when we talk about flowing waters, we're already in this notion of this hierarchy. The water is coming from above. It's coming from heaven. The water is coming from heaven. So here are these four rivers that come down, water the world, and as they lo- get lower and lower on this mountain, they lose their quality. They become mixed with the, the, the local places and then they become, they become less pure, you could say. And then he talks about, talks about the beings. He talks about uh, the children of light. So he talks about from their abodes, the children of light descend. They rejoice in the midst of the world uh, where they had been persecuted. They dance on the surface of the sea and they do not sink. Because he, St. Ephraim understands that paradise is, is always there. It's always, it's not something which was only there in the past. It's always, it's always there. And then if we want to participate in paradise, there are ways in which we participate in paradise. And he gives us the ways, he tells us. First of all, he, he tells us in the Old Testament what those were. He says, these, this structure with this mountain, and he divides it into three. So he has 
the tree of life at the top. And that is, is the same as the Holy of Holies of the temple, of the tabernacle. And then he has the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's the same as the holy place in the tabernacle or the temple. And then he has the lower part, the, the gate or the fig tree, uh, which would be the outer court of the tabernacle. So he divides it into these three parts. Why is the fig tree, why is the fig tree the third part? Do you, have, do you know the story why there's the fig tree in, this, in that story? Why is there a fig tree in the story of paradise? Who remembers? Sorry? They cover themselves. Exactly. Right. So that becomes the first covering. So then everything else is going to flow from there, this notion of the covering. So imagine this, these levels as three coverings, three veils, the three veils of the temple. You have the veil to the Holy of Holies, you have the veil to the holy place, and then outside you have this rougher coverings. You have the covering of skin, the garments of skin. St. Ephraim doesn't talk about the garments of skin, but St. Gregor of Nyssa definitely talks about the garments of skin. And he explains how the covering of the tabernacle, which was hairy, it was made of animal skins, is the same as the garments of skin that Adam and Eve put on themselves. So as we, as we get lower and lower on the, uh, on the hierarchy of beings, there is this need to cover ourselves more, right? Um, and it's not that hard to understand that. It's not that hard to understand it. Uh, I always talk in my, in, my, in my talks about the garments of skin, trying to understand what that is. What does it mean that Adam and Eve had to cover themselves with garments? Uh, and it really does have to do with this moving out towards death. So in the garden, they were self-sufficient to the extent that they were only dependent on God. And as they move away from the garden, then they start to become dependent on, they, they start to have to deal with the outside world more and more. Right? The reason why God gave Adam and Eve garments of skin was to encounter the, the thorns. God said, because of your fall, the trees will start to produce thorns. And so the world will be hostile to you. And you have to cover yourself in order to face that hostility. So you add a layer of clothing right, to, to be able to face the cold. And then if you want more cold, you go further out into a place where human beings, it's more difficult, the world is more hostile to you. You add a house. And if you want to go further out into a world that's hostile to you, you add a wall to your city. You add this and that. And you add technologies in order to supplement your existence out in the world of the, of the hostile world. In the story of, of the fall, you see it happening. There's the fall, Adam and Eve have garments of skin, and then there's another fall where Cain kills his brother, and then what does Cain do? Found a city. So you have this garment around Adam and Eve, and then Cain puts a garment around, around let's say, the group, and then his descendants, they end up creating weapons of war and steel, you know, metal weapons, metallurgy, in order to add that. And then in the, at the, the final result of that is the flood, where it all breaks apart. You can't, at some point, that garment, you keep adding garments around yourself, at some point, you know, it cracks. And then and I went through that recently, for those who know that I've been on a, through a flood. The, 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 our city, they built a dike at the end of, a, of, a, of our city because they used to get flooded. And then they started to trust that dike completely and everybody forgot that the dike even basically existed. It was like, this is just normal world. As the waters rose and rose and rose, and at some point the dike gave in and the water came in. So these garments of skin, uh, which, are, which are immediately described by the fathers as our physical bodies, that our, that our fleshly bodies are the first garments of skin, that we all know that those, they give us, they give us protection for a while, but they're gonna break apart. So better do what you need to do while you've got them, you know, uh, 
because at some point they're going to go away. All right. So, so the notion is that this thing, this mountain, it goes all the way out until... So as Said Ephraim had different ways of describing it. He talks about when Adam and Eve fell, then God chased them out of the garden, and then they were lower down on the slopes of the garden. And then when Cain killed Abel, then Cain was chased lower down still, and then Seth was higher up on the mountain. Right? So it, it is, it, it, it's a hierarchy of beings. It's an it's a, it's ontological hierarchy. The more you're closer to God, the higher you up on the mountain. The further you are from God, the lower you are on this, this mountain. For all, all these, those who are orthodox, it's the ladder of divine ascent. It's the same thing. The ladder of divine ascent is exactly what he's talking about here. You know, several centuries before uh, that, that text was written, uh, the, 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 it's, the same, it's the same structure, okay? Um, St. Ephraim talks about how this is the same structure as the ark, the Noah's ark, because the human beings were on top, and then the birds were there after, after, uh, after lower than the humans, and then the animals were at the bottom of the ark. Right? Like I said, it's the same as the tabernacle. The tabernacle had the glory of God at the, in the, in the, uh, in the Holy of Holies, and on the outside there was the outer court, where they had these, and, and around the tabernacle, they also had these, these animal skins that were around it. So it's, it, it's all of it is the same, is the same structure. Um, and so then when, when, when it, it says in the Bible that the children of God mixed with the daughters of men, right? In this, he actually gives such a, he's able to avoid the problem of the whole angel thing because he, he, he has it on a mountain. And so you have the, the, daughter, the, the, the children of Seth, the sons of Seth, that go down the mountain, and then they, they mix with the daughters of Cain. And so in, they go, they, they're, they're going down the ontological hierarchy, and they're perpetuating this, this fall, like going further and further down. Um, and then finally, like I said, you have this fig tree that was an image of the, the, the covering. And, and St. Ephraim does a beautiful thing. He tells us why Christ curses the fig tree. Right? That text, which is the, one of the strangest texts in the gospel, right? Christ comes up to the fig tree and he curses it because it hasn't produced fruit. Well, St. Ephraim says it, 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 Saint Ephraim just, like, just makes total sense because that's how the fall started. Adam and Eve fell and they tried to cover themselves. And Christ is saying, I'm removing those coverings. I'm going to remove them. And in the process, he, in the pro, it's, it's also in the, in the story of his entry into Jerusalem, he's going towards crucifixion. He removes the, the garments of, of uh, the, the, the fig garments. And then he ends up by ripping the last veil in the temple and entering into the Holy of Holies. And so Christ is going, he's going back up. He's doing it in reverse. He's, He's going, he's going back up the, the mountain in that, in that story. Part of it is cursing the fig tree. All right. So does that, does that make sense to some of you? Like, do you, do, can you kind of see how this pattern is repeated in Scripture in different places? Uh, and the structure of a church, the actual architectural structure of the church, follows the same structure, right? Our church, our church architecture has three sections, basic sections. We have the, the, the altar, the Holy of Holies. Then we have the nave, which the, 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 the communions uh, gather. Um, and then we have the narthex, where is the buffer space between the outside, right? We chase, we don't, nobody does it anymore really, but in theory, we, we, uh, we chase the catechumens out at a certain moment in, in uh, the liturgy in order to create that actual ontological hierarchy. We're actually doing that. So we have the priests in the, in the altar, we have the, the faithful in the nave, and we have those that are in between. Right? Remember, St. Ephraim said, that which is in between is lower on, on the, so we have this in between in the narthex, and then we have the flood or the chaos on the outside. Okay, so hopefully, 
I made my case for that, at least, because I'm not done yet. <laughs> and so, because this structure exists at all the different levels, when the incarnation happens, then it gets in, like it falls into the personal level. Christ is a person. Christ is also the glory of God, which descends down on the holy mountain. Right? That's what Christ is. He is the ultimate, uh, he is the ultimate uh, accomplishment of that promise, of that image of the glory of God descending and, 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 uh, and coming down onto the Ark of the Covenant, coming down onto the holy mountain, all of this. So, inevitably, the church fathers are going to associate who with the garden. If you look at the icon right behind you, if you look at the icon of the Last Judgment, there's an image of paradise. And there are two images, two basic images of paradise in paradise. One is the bosom of Abraham. Right? So think about, think about this ontological hierarchy that I'm talking to you about. You have a source, Abraham, then he has children, they have children, they have children, they have children, and it widens out, right? It becomes, it becomes a pyramid. Abraham more, has more and more children, has more and more children. And then when they, when they die, if they're righteous, where do they go? They go back. They go back into their place of origin. They go back to paradise. They go back to their source. They go back to the bosom of Abraham. We could do that. We could keep going until Adam if we wanted to. You know, we go to Abraham, but we could all say we're all in the bosom of of uh, Adam, right? But then the other image is the mother of God, right? Because she is the place where Christ came down and manifested himself through. And so we see, for example, in this image, the, I always tell people, the reason why we put the mother of God in paradise isn't just because she's in paradise, is because she is paradise. Right? The reason why we show the bosom of Abraham in paradise isn't because, the, because Abraham is in paradise, it's because it is paradise. That is an image of paradise. Okay? And so the, and so the, the fathers will bring us on that, on that line. St. Proclus says, The Holy Mother of God and Virgin Mary has gathered us here. She is the pure treasure of virginity, the intended paradise of the second Adam. So in that, that quote, there's a lot of things going on. First of all, she's the one who has gathered us here. What does that mean? It means that the church is also paradise. I already told you, right? It's the same. That this, this structure, this, this thing, this is paradise. I mean, you could say it's not the, the it, you could say that the, there's an eschatological, you know, glorification of that reality where at some point all of creation is going to, to kind of come into this, this, this ultimate revelation of return to paradise, but also the holy city, like, of course. But we can participate in paradise already to the extent that we are gathered by the Holy Virgin into the church. And then she is the intended paradise for the second Adam. The second Adam is, of course, Christ. So, what is one of the names? You, do some of you know one of the names for Mount Athos? Mount Athos is called the Garden of the Mother of God. Isn't that a great name? What do you think they're referring to when they say the Garden of the Mother of God? They're, again, the monks, the holy monks, in their, in their divine intuition, they're referring to paradise. They're telling you Athos is an image, is a participation, is is a participation in paradise. And this image is one of my, my favorite, the, the image of, of the mother of God, uh, of, the holy, of the holy fount, where you, if you look at her, right, she's, she's basically a mountain. She's, she's this mountain. Uh, and then you can see that the water is flowing down from her like the water is flowing from the mountain of paradise. 
There's another image as well, too. You have it in your narthex, which is the mother of God as the burning bush. If you look at that icon, not all the time, but often they'll make the burning bush in a way that it fills up the entire mountain. And so it looks like the mother of God is like a mountain inside the mountain. So you have this amazing image of, the, of Mount, Mount Sinai as being, as being the mother of God herself. All right. So, so the return to paradise in the, in the, in the fathers, especially in St. Gregory of Nyssa, who's one of my favorite fathers, he talks about it as the removal of the garments of skin. So he says, in order then to go back into this space, we have to remove the coverings, right? Remove the coverings. And the coverings have to do with our passions. They have to do with our, our sins. And you have to think about it because it's not, it's not arbitrary, right? Why do we sin? We often sin because we think that that's where life is, right? We, we think that that's, we have, we have a desire to eat and those desires are not wrong. Our desires, none of our desires are wrong. We have a desire for sexual, sexual desire. We have all these different desires, but the problem is when we, 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 we enter into that and we, we think that that is going to be our protection, that if I eat, then I'm Right? If I give in to this desire, then I will find life there, that I, I, will, I will be safe. Right? But th that's why we have ascetic practices, because that's not where true safety is. That's not where true life is. And so St. Gregory Nietzsche talks about this removal of the, gar the, the, the garments of skin. But he talks about it in the sense, for example, he talks about how Moses, when Moses went up into the mountain to see the burning bush, it says that he removed his sandals in order to enter into the holy place. And, and St. Gregory will say, you need, we need to remove the garments from the feet of our soul right, in order to come into the, the presence of God. You think about St. Paul when he talked about, he talked about the circumcision of the heart. Right? So he, he uses the image of the Old Testament of removing this layer of skin. Right? Removing this layer of skin in order to go back to something which is rectified. Right? To remove the layer of skin. And he says, no, no. He said, yeah, fine. That's, that's good. It's, it's fine. The, the circumcision was fine. It's an image of something which is way more deep, way more profound, which is that you need to remove the veils around your heart. You need to remove the garments which, protect, which, which you use to protect your heart or you use to cover your heart. And so the entering into the, the, the temple, the entering into paradise, all of those now come into the person, where the structure of the person ends up being the same structure as paradise, same structure as the temple, the same structure as the church. Uh, and so the, the church fathers talk about this hierarchy of being. We have we have a capacity, which they talk about the noose, the spiritual intellect, intellection, the, the capacity to grasp God, to, 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 to come into contact directly with God. And that would be up there at the top of the mountain. It would be up there, you know, where the tree of life is. Right? And then we have the, 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 the soul part, you could say the, the, the thoughts, the feelings, the, the desires, all of that is in the middle part. And then at the lower part, you would have the, the body, or you could also understand the, the passions as being in the lower part too. You can just see it as a hierarchy. You have the, the, the noose or the spiritual capacity, the thoughts, the, the, the passions, and you could imagine the body as even being kind of outside. Saint, Saint Ephraim, he, he, taught, he has this great image. He says that there are no animals in paradise. I think that's weird, right? Because in the Bible, it doesn't say that. There are no animals in paradise. He says that, I, even in here, I drew it different from what St. Ephraim described it. He says, the serpent was not in paradise. He said, the serpent came up to the gate of paradise. And Adam and Eve had to come down the mountain in order to encounter the, the serpent at the gate. Okay? And so this idea that the church fathers always uh, attach our bodies to the animal part, like the, the animality, 
I mean, it's not, it's not stupid. It's obviously true. That is what we have in common with the animals. You know, the, the, the evolutionists have been, you know, the, the church fathers knew that our bodies we have in common with the animals. It's not a surprise that we have the same structure as the animals. Um, but this idea that they have to descend the mountain in order to encounter the animals. So it, it actually gives a, it's a, gives a very interesting, um, very interesting possible solution to the problem of death. This whole problem of people talking about, you know, was there death before? Was it, you know, how is it that there could, there, could be, there could be death before? But if you see the, the paradise as an ontological hierarchy, instead of just, just seeing it as a, a, as a story, then you understand that the animals, the, 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 mort the mortality was already there, you could say, down at the bottom of this hierarchy already. It was already possibility down below this, 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 cosmic, uh, this cosmic structure. I'm just suggesting that. I'm not saying that, that, that that's a solution, but it's something, definitely something to think about. All right. So I had this, this, this great, one of my favorite quotes from St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain. He says, we must therefore keep in mind that as the center of a wagon wheel has a certain number of spokes going out to the circumference of the circle and returning to the center where they meet, so also is the heart of man like a center where all the senses, all the powers of the body and all the activities of the soul are united. And so you can see that structure. Again, he describes it as a flat wheel, but it doesn't matter. It's the same thing as a, as a mountain. Right? You, have a, you have a spoke, a center, then you have all these things that come out which, which emanate from the center but as they get further and further away, imagine a wheel. The spokes on the wheel, as they get further away from the center, what happens? They're further from each other. They're further from the center. If you turn the wheel, what happens the further you get out? The wheel actually goes faster. So if you turn a wheel, the further you are on the wheel, the faster it spins. The closer you are towards the center, the slower it spins. And, as, and if you come into the very center of the wheel, it doesn't spin at all. It actually stops. The, the axis of the wheel is, is, doesn't move. Right? It's this invisible point in a spinning circle that doesn't, doesn't move, actually. And so this image, this is it. This is the image. This is, this is the image. When the fathers talk about go into the heart, go into the heart. You have to enter into your heart. It's because it's all the senses, they come into this central, invisible point, this, 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 this place in the human person uh, where, I guess, movement stops. I'm not a saint, so I, I don't. <laughs> it's like I don't. But then it also, but it, it, it doesn't mean that everything on the outside, none of it is bad, right? All of creation is good. And, and St. Ephraim emphasizes that too. Problem isn't that, you know, like that what's down on the mountain is not, is not bad. But it, it, it becomes bad to the extent that it forgets the top, right? And that's, the church fathers always talk about memory. That's the whole idea of memory. So as you, in your, you have these desires on the edge of you, you have these things pulling you in different directions. If you forget the memory of God, if you forget God, then that's when those things are going to destroy you. That's when they're going to devour you. But if you remember God, then like St. Ephraim talks about the children of light that come down from the mountain and participate in all of creation. and They walk on water. This beautiful image of how the saint can engage with all of creation without it being a danger to him. He's able to come down the entire hierarchy and the flood for him is basically a floor that he can walk on like Christ walked on the waters. So this beautiful image of how everything participates. But if you forget, what happens? I don't know how the story of St. Peter. No, what happens if you're walking on water and then you, you start to focus on what's going on instead of focusing on the face of your divine Lord that's in front of you, you sink. And, and in that image you get, right? You get, what, is, what does St. Peter say when he's sinking? Lord Jesus, I'm going to say the prayer. It's like, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. doesn't say it in that exact words, but that's, that's the basic thing he's saying. He's saying, have mercy on me. And that's our prayer, right? That's, that's, the, whole of, that's the whole of the mystical tradition of the church is, 
this capacity to, even when you're falling, even when you're lower, to remember the glory of God that descended onto paradise. And it's all the same, it's all the same uh, structure. All right. So I, this is, everybody's very silent. Okay. Uh, this is the first time that I talk about this to the extent that I'm talking about it now. Okay. And so I, I know it's possible that I have stretched some people maybe beyond the, the breaking point. Um, and so is it okay if I take questions? Is that, is that okay? I would, so what I would like to, I'd like to take questions from all of you because I know that a lot of this stuff is, you know, I'm reading the Shabbat I'm getting all excited and I'm, and I'm, uh, and I'm, and I'm seeing it in the icons and I'm seeing this, but, I, but sometimes, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to think that way. We're so used to uh, this idea of this kind of materialist uh, way of understanding the world that it's very hard to think of these embedded realities uh, in each other. So I'd like to open up questions for you if you, if you have any. Uh, thinking about moral garments kind of hashing that out, do you think it's so much the garment, or is it the fact that if someone receives a garment by God, like the garments of skin to protect, but they stay in connect connection and receiving the gift versus taking the garment, mm. they forget, like the prodigal son takes the inheritance and goes out, but when it's lost, he returns back because the garment allowed him not to have to remember God or home. He felt independent. Right. But when everything is taken from him, he comes back to center to what is, because now he's dependent again. Okay. Is the reception or the... So, so I'll repeat, just repeat the basic question just for the recording. So the, the, the question was about the garments of skin, whether or not the, the garments of skin uh, themselves are a problem, you could say, or whether it's because they, they received them in pride or they received them, that they took them and they didn't receive them, let's say, in the proper manner. Right. So, so here's, here's the, here's, this is actually a really powerful thing for me, at least, to, to have seen this in the, in the fathers and seen this in the story, is that St. Ephraim talks about how the garments of skin, the garment that before the fall, human beings were not naked, that they were covered in glory. And we hear that, right? We hear that in our liturgy. We hear that in, our, in, our, in the kind of the, the orthodox culture, that Adam and Eve were covered in glory. And then when they fell, God gave them garments of skin. Now, what's fascinating about that tradition is that when you find out where it comes from, it's a pre-Christian tradition. It comes from the, the, the early rabbinical era, before, like, just, just before Christ. And the text they used to talk about how we, Adam and Eve had garments of glory is a different reading of the word garments of skin. So when it says God gave Adam and Eve garments of skin, in the original Hebrew or Aramaic, there's a way to read the word garments of skin as garments of glory. And so there's this idea that one can become the other, right? So, so St. Ephraim actually talks about this. He talks about how uh, that which is the blessing which is, like you said, the blessing which is taken in pride becomes a curse, right? Now, then you can see it the other way around, right? That's when the image of Christ just appears to you, you know, when you think that you can take the curse in humility and turn it into a blessing, right? You could take the garments of skin, you could take the consequence of Adam's curse, which is death, and that could be transformed into garments of glory. And it then, then all of a sudden, a lot of Christian practice just makes so much sense. A lot of this notion of dying to yourself, a lot of, a lot of the ideas about why we do the things we do, if you can see that, all of a sudden, everything makes so much sense. And then, like the image I, I always like to use the most is, to me, the, 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 the crown of thorns is one of the most powerful images in the entire Bible. It's one of the most powerful images because here is exactly that happening. God said, you have sinned. 
Because of you, because of the fall, the world will produce thorns. The world will produce these spiky, dead things that will be hostile. And then Christ takes that exact consequence of the fall and he receives it as a crown. And he flips it all around. And this whole story of the crucifixion, that's what it is all the time. He's flipping it all around. He's humiliated. He's beaten. They mock him. They treat him mockingly as a king. But in fact, he's actually manifesting his kingship. They put him on the cross. They put a sign above him saying to mock him that he's the, he's the king of Jews, to shame him. But it's flipping back and he actually is the king of Jews and the king of glory. And so the, the image of Christ, if you understand that, idea of the garments of skin and you see how Christ transforms them into these garments of glory. It's a, yeah, to me, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I've seen in the fathers and in, 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 and in the story of, of Christ that has knocked me over completely, you know, because all of a sudden a lot of it starts to make sense you know, that Christ is really is solving the puzzle all the time. He's solving this puzzle right here, this puzzle that was set up right in the beginning of Genesis. Christ is solving that puzzle. It makes the, the fact that for his garment, they cast lots, that much more poignant. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. it, it and, and also the, the whole idea of, of lots in terms of this, this idea of, there's a lot of things in the story of Christianity which, is, which, which have to do with this. Like the fact also that the foreigners converted. That's also really part of this. Right? Because in St. Gregory of Nyssa, he constantly describes the garments of skin as the Egyptians in Exodus. He talks about, you know, uh, he, he talks about how Moses killed the Egyptian and killing the Egyptian is related to circumcision. And circumcision is related to baptism. And then all of that, it's like killing this idea of getting rid of that which is foreign, removing the garments of skin, right? And so, although we do need to do that, removing of the garments of skin, you see Christ, he actually takes the foreigner, right? And he... He makes them into his glory, right? He, he, he takes Rome. He takes the, the ba whore of Babylon. He, he takes the, 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 those that destroyed Jerusalem, those that killed him, and then flips that completely upside down. It's crazy. It, yeah, it's, it's mind blowing. I don't think that has to do with it. It's probably my memory. So it seems like you're removing our sin. Yeah. Well, say, say, yeah, so it's a form of hiding. Right? The garments of skin are, they, they do end up being a form of hiding. And I mean, come on, we all know that that's what it is. That's why I wear clothes to hide myself. But, that, but, but then a lot of the actions I have out in the world, this false thing that I present to you guys, you know, and, and uh, you know, my, you know, like my, my pretensions, my, all of these things that I present to you, they're a way to hide something, obviously. We all have that. We all kind of engage in that transaction. I would say, or maybe it's just me. <laughs> uh, and so this, but what's amazing in, in, uh, in the story, in St. Gregory of Nyssa especially is amazing, is that St. Gregory talks about removing the garments of skin, right? So he has this image of, of Moses drowning the Egyptians in the Red Sea, right? So that's baptism, going down, leaving the garments of skin at the bottom of the water. Then, as he ascends, removing his sandals and then shedding not just that, but in, and uh, St. Ephraim talks about this also, is that on Sinai, there is this hierarchy that sets itself up because the people are at the bottom worshiping the golden calf, right? Then you have the, the, the priests, which are higher up. Then you have Aaron, who's higher up, and only Moses goes to the summit. So as Moses is ascending, he sheds this quantity, he sheds this quantity. He leaves the people down below and they end up worshiping the animal, right? And then he leaves the, the, the others and he even leaves his own brother and then he ascends into the holy place. And so he sheds all these garments as he's going into the, uh, the, the, the presence of God. But then when he enters into the presence of God, he's given the plans for the tabernacle, which is amazing, right? Because in the tabernacle, there are garments of skin. 
And so St. Gregory of Nyssa actually, he, he deals with it. He says, don't be offended by the fact that here he is, he ascends this whole thing, he sheds all these garments, and then when he, he attains the highest point, he, he encounters the garments of skin. And he says, he says that, that it is an image of the crucifixion, right? Where Christ fully, in, you could say, fully embodied the whole question of the garments of skin. But even more than that, it's saying that as you shed the garments, you, you get them back, right? Because there's nothing wrong with them. Like I said, they become these garments of glory. There's nothing wrong with our body. There's nothing wrong with our passions. There's nothing, all of it is good. God created it good. The problem is that, is that they're not in their proper place. Right? They're always, they, they try to pull on the blanket and be everything, right? They, they, our passions, they try to convince us that that's all we are. And I, but if you, if you, I mean, I'm telling you this, I, like I said, I'm not a saint. I did not get it. I've never entered into the divine darkness. So just know that. But if you trust the fathers, they talk about this process. So we can get glimpses of it though. We get these little glimpses because we, when we do, when we are able to shed some passion, then we, we can see that our dependency on that passion was some, so silly. It's like, how is it that I was so taken up by that? How is it that I thought that this was all that I was, that was all my life. So, I didn't know what you were talking about earlier in the talk, which humanity has not worried since the beginning. And it's not just that we have not worried about the beginning, but we have not worried about the beginning. Yeah. Um, which, with a slide, is inviting the higher parts now. Right. Um, and letting it all converge to try to find glory is to stand Mm -hmm. um, talking about the children of light, talking about the flood, um, supposing you know, the humans that are in the majesty starting at the bottom of the mountain, you see that the motion of the children of light is a mere image of my glory to the passing first in order to see Right. Well, there's definitely that, there's definitely a relationship between the two. I mean, we see it in the story of Christ. Like Christ comes down. Then he ascends, and he promises that he's going to return. And when he returns, he's going to bring a judgment. He's going, to set, he's going to settle it all. Everything's going to be set when he comes back. Um, and so I think that, for sure, this, this notion of, there is this idea of ascent and descent. And I think that you get that, uh, you get that in the fathers as well. I mean, in the whole idea of, a, of, a, of, a, of an, an ascetic who reaches theosis, but then, you know, out of love and out of mercy and out of grace will then give us his teachings, will give us, you know, and, and we can participate in, you know, a little bit of what he has encountered, you know, by our capacity to, to interact with them. You know, even the saints, is, is, it's the same, right? We, the saints, they, they, they help us to participate in something that they've reached that we haven't yet reached. They kind of bring us up with them, we hope. That they bring us up with them. Yes, Father. One thing fundamentally, what we're talking about is questions that human beings have been asking uh, in multiple cultures. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking of Aristotle's hierarchy of being. Mm -hmm. it, it follows the same pattern. So what we're, what we're engaging isn't just abstract theology, it's our pursuit of humanity and what it means to be a human being. And this has been studied in various cultures for various ages. That's why I'm not often going to go to Greece. You may see uh, Plato and Aristotle and Martha. Mm -hmm. you know, they don't have the, 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 the divine light emanating from them, but they're moving in a direction. And quite often they're talking about these same the same discussion yeah. is taking place. But the human being, as you were saying, being three parts, a, a mind, soul, and body. And for us to be human is, and to fulfill our purpose, is when those three are functioning according to the will, the will being the mind, the divine, the soul, and the body, and us uh, coming to that state. How do we do that practically and through the sacraments of the church, how does this restore us and give us the opportunity to climb 
time the amount the amount which was sin. Right. right. You know, so this how how's it move this up? So how does that time which time you say? Right. Okay. Well, I have I don't know if I'm gonna give you the I'll give you the answer that I understand. That's all I can give you. Is so in order for in order for this to happen, let's say on an individual level, it also has to be happening at all levels. It has to stack up. Right? It can't just happen. That's the that's the mistake that a lot of modern religious you know attitudes take. Is that it's just me and God? It's not just you and God. Right? Because all of these things stack up. The pattern of you is the pattern of what a, of, a, of a community, and then it's also the pattern of the world, you know. And so Christ gives us a way for it to all stack up. And, and the sacraments and communion, that's, that's it. He takes the things that, he takes a lot of, the communion is, is, it's hard to talk about the communion. <laughs> Let's talk about a little bit. He takes the most basic, the basic images of what, uniting together is. So there's the eating together, right? There's also a certain sexual imagery of, 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 a, of the bride and the groom joining. Um, and so all of this, he kind of gives us as this point that we all come to and we, we, we all surround. But he adds a scandal in it too. He, he goes all the way to, Christ always goes all the way to the edge. Goes all the way to the edge. And he says something as crazy as eat flesh and blood. Like that is just crazy to say that. But you have to understand, like I said, what Christ is doing. Christ is saying, all of this, I'm going to bring all of this up together. I'm going to give it, I'm going to bring it up, all of it. None of it's going to be left over. And so he takes the most scandalous image, right, of offering us his own body and blood, something which is completely uh, uh, forbidden. And even in terms of sacrificial language, the, 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 the priest would eat the bread of the sacrifice. They never would ever drink the blood of the sacrifice, ever, ever, ever. Blood had to go down into the ground. But Christ says, no, all of it, all of it, I'm bringing all of this together. And so, and so to participate in communion is really to, to come together as a community. Then also, as we do that, we also have to go to confession. We have to, to come right in ourselves. But then we also are communing with the entire cosmos, the whole thing, all the way to the edge. And, 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 and we, we talk about also how we are uniting with the angels as well during the moment of communion. All of this is coming together. And this image of, of, of communion especially, I mean, it is this, it is this eschatological moment. It, it, it is a moment that is beyond all moments, you know. Return to paradise, but also the, 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 the holy city, all of that, the beginning and the end, oh, smashed together. Everything's smashed together in communion. It's hard to think about communion. Probably best not to, actually. <laughs> That's why the church fathers were really tell us to shut up about communion. Right, I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> Paradise. Well, for sure in St. Ephraim, he really does talk about, he warns us in some, I, I think I have some of the quotes, but he warns us to be careful when we're talking about paradise. He says that these things that he describes in paradise are names. Like he says, be careful of the names that we use to describe paradise. Uh, because paradise is, is he, 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 he flirts with the idea that it's, it is like a purely spiritual description that he's doing. But in other places, he seems to really talk about it as a place. And I think that, I think that if we understand, it is a place. It has to be a place, right? But it's a place, I think that it's, it's a place which brings all places together. I don't know how else to say it. And I, and I, and I, it, it, the way that St. Ephraim describes it, it's definitely not a place you could find on the map. That, for sure. I think that 
if you re it's really impossible to imagine that the way that he describes how, you know, it's like the summit is beyond everything and the, the base is beyond the ocean. It's really tough to think that it's, it's the whole map, you know, it's everything c coming together. Um, and so I don't know in terms of the, in terms of the actual rivers that we use those names for today, like how he would have understood their relationship to, to, to that. I, sadly, I, I don't know. Does that kind of answer your question? It's tough. It's tough stuff to think about, and it's tough to talk about this stuff too. Right. And so the, the, the image, the image of the the last image in Revelation is so amazing because it recapitulates the fall in Genesis. Right? I told you, we often forget, we read the genealogies. People, we need to read the genealogies in the Bible. They're amazing. The genealogies have great stuff in there. So when they describe the genealogy of the, of the fall up to the flood, it talks about how Cain built the city. Right? Cain builds the city, not Seth. Right? The fallen one builds the city. And, 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 and that movement towards the city leads to the flood and war and all that. And in the Old Testament, there's, a, there's weird stuff about that too. Like Solomon has to get a foreign king to build the temple. Like there's weird stuff. And in, in the, it, it has to be a foreign king which sends the Jews back to Israel to build their walls around Jerusalem. There's this weird relationship between the city, the construction, the stable construction, and this interaction with the stranger, the foreigner, or something like that. Um, but then, in, and, and Cain, it represents the ultimate, let's say, foreigner or stranger or whatever. But then when you get to the end of Revelations, then it all is taken in together. The city that, the fall, you have the tree in the middle and the city on the edge. Well, here you have the same image. You have the tree in the middle and you have the city around it, but now it's glorious. Now it's this glorious city which participates, which fully remembers, let's say, the name of God and so participates in this totality. And so, you know, the, the, the New Testament is always an answer to this problem in the Old Testament. And I keep telling people that puzzle, the first chapters of Genesis are like a massive puzzle. And then we're given the key, you know, in the, in the, in the New Testament. That's fine. <laughs> I see. I got see. I got Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, in the Bible, there are several very powerful images of that exactly, and sometimes it's presented both ways. Sometimes it's presented as God remembering someone, or someone remembering God. Right. So in in the story of the flood, for example, they go out into the flood, and then when it's been all this time, it says. God remembered Noah. Right? That's it. That's the, that's the connection. And then Jonah, when Jonah goes down into the, the fish, goes to the bottom of the, of, the, of, the, of the ocean, then after three days, it says, Jonah remembered God. And so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you are. Right? It just depends which direction you're facing. And you get that sense, too, if you look at the, this notion of the, the, the divine ladder. Right? So you... you no matter where you are on that ladder, if you're looking up and you're moving up, then you're, you're good. But if you turn, even if you're at the top, you're gonna fall, like it doesn't matter where you are. And so this idea of memory is really this, this possibility of connecting to something when it's far away. That's what memory is. If I if I'm, remember my parents, that's I'm connected to my parents, even though they're far away from me. And if I forget my parents, then and that, then they start to fragment and, you know, I start to, 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 I'm not connected to them anymore. So communion could be the perfect memory, you could call it. Like it's perfect memory in the sense that it is, obviously we're not physically sitting in the high, you're not physically sitting in that room when Christ is giving out the, the bread and the wine, but 
it is, we're perfectly participating in that event through perfect memory. So although we are 2,000 years later, although we are hundred, you know, thousands of miles away, we have the capacity to, to fully remember that moment and therefore participated in it fully. So th that's the idea. And when you we hear the, the, the fathers, when they talk about <coughs> the memory of God, <clears throat> they know that if you remember God, then you are that you, you're connected to God, no matter where you are. You could be in the, and you get the sense, you get that also in the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son goes all the way out and, blah, 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 and then all of a sudden, he remembers his father. He's like, okay, what am I doing? I should be in my father's house. And already, he's starting, his salvation has started right there. Right? And no matter where you are, and that's the amazing thing about Christianity too, is that no matter where you are, there's the possibility if you're the, the worst, you know, thief, murderer, whatever, whatever, anything that you've done doesn't mean that you're fine where you are, but if you remember God, you, you can get on that road back. There's a, there's a road for you to come back if you just remember God. Um, and so, does that kind of help a little bit, maybe? But everything works that way, okay? So, that's, like, I, I keep talking about how that's the structure of reality. That's, just, that, that's, like, that's what it is for everything. So, you have a, you have a, any object. I always use the image of a cup. People are going to get annoyed because I always use the same image of a cup. So you have a cup. Right? The cup has uh, an identity. It has a cupness. Something that makes it a cup. Then it also has parts. Right? It's made of stuff. It has parts. It has a handle. It has a height. It has a, it has, it's made of stuff. Right? I can make that cup forget its cupness. I can throw it to the ground. Smash it. Boom. It's forgotten. It's forgotten its cupness. It's lost its unity. It's fragmented. It's, it's broken. Its parts have stopped being assembled together. And so when that happens, when the parts stop communing with the whole, that's forgetting. Right? And then, but if you remember, then that's how they hold together. Right? And that's how even objects exist in the world. They exist through memory. They have an identity, and they have parts which remember their identity. We participate in that. Right? It's through us. It's through, it's through us being the, 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 uh, the, the laboratory of, 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 of uniting things together. We, we make that, not, not, through our, not through our personal thing, but as humans, human nature participates in that existence. But it, that's how the world exists. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So Gregor of Nyssa talks about, I don't know if I, I think I have a bunch of these quotes and I, St. Gregor of Nyssa has an amazing quote where he talks about, okay, here's, here it is. This is a great quote. So St. Gregor of Nyssa says, liability to death then taken from brute creation, right? This idea that I was talking about, this ontological hierarchy with, with, let's say, potentiality or death at the bottom. So, liability to death was taken from brute creation, was provisionally made to envelop the nature created for immortality. It enwrapped it externally, but not internally. It grasped the sentient part of man, but laid no hold upon the divine image, which could be called like the heart of heart, you could say. Right? Christ in you, the Logos hidden in your heart. Now he says the sentient part, this outer part, does not disappear, but is dissolved. Disappearance is the passing away into non-existence, but dissolution is the dispersion again into the constituent elements of the world which, of which it was composed. That's death. Death is the center cannot hold, things fall apart. That's death is when things break apart from what it is that held them together. And so that image of the garden, right, it, that's it. It's this mountain. The further you go down the mountain, the farther you are from the top, but also the farther you are from the other things that are coming down the mountain. Right? So it, it's, that's what fragmentation does. It, it not only does it isolate us from our source, but it also isolates us from each other. 
right? That's, what, that's when communities break down and that nihilism that, that people are feeling today is because not only are we no longer in communion in, in the sense that we are all turned towards the altar, all turned towards God, all turned towards Christ, but we, because we have stopped doing that, we're also not able to commune with each other. And that is also, we're being further and further away from each other. And that loneliness that people feel is a consequence of the incapacity to not, and people are trying to, to find ways to, to connect people here at the margin, connect people, up, but it's not gonna happen. It doesn't happen unless you all look in the same direction. Unless we're all moving towards the center, you can do what you want around here, but it's gonna be Tinder. That's what it's gonna be. It's not gonna be real connect connection. It's gonna be artificial, superficial, uh, you know, passionate connections, but it's not going to be the real thing. Unless we turn towards the middle, unless we turn towards the tree of life, towards the altar, towards the glory of God, which is in the middle, and we all move in that direction, that's when we start to get closer to each other. It goes together. So a lot of the efforts that people are doing now to say like, oh, we're gonna help these young people, you know, it, it's a very provisional. It's not gonna, it's not, in the long term, there's only, we need something common to, 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 to look towards. Sadly, sometimes that, sometimes people will find short gap like measures to get that. And that's where a lot of, a lot of the weird stuff we're seeing here today, like coming up today, like the kind of identitarianism that we're seeing, that's, that's what it is. It's a short gap. It's like saying, okay, we're breaking apart. We need to find these things to bring us together. And so we, 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 we attach ourselves on these little identities that we have, whether it's on the right or the left, you know, we say, oh, we're all this. And let's, let's use this as our common thing so we can come together. But that, yeah, it can be dangerous. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and ultimately that wheel, if it remembers its center, it could be, it's, a cos it could, it's as big as the cosmos, right? Everything is connected in the end, to the middle, so. Yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah. Well, they're, they're the four directions. They're everything in the sense that they're, they're, they're you can imagine us going in the four directions. So if you look at, if you look at, um, if you look at like Persian gardens, you get a sense of this, right? There's a, there's a fountain in the middle and then there are these four rivers that go out in the four directions. Uh, I mean, it's a cross. It, it, it just, it's, a cross is, a cross is, 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 is kind of everything Reduced to the, the, the smallest, the, the, the ease, the, let's say, the, the most condensed way to represent everything is a cross. Because it's an extension in one direction, an extension in the other. If you keep going, it fills up everything. And so it, it's, 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 the four directions are probably the best way to understand that. It's like it's an extension out into the world. The, the basic extension to fill up everything would be four, right? Does that make, does that make sense a bit? Yeah. A little bit? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, let me just finish that. That's why there are also four Gospels, right? That's why there are four beasts on the, 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 on the, the, the cherubim, right? So it's like these four things that are on all the directions, right? When you were talking about the technology of the center, so if, like, we have an example of paradise and the way the tower of power, yeah, well, the Tower of Babel is the same story as, as, as the garden. It's the same story, right? So, so this is something I didn't go into in, the, in this explanation. But St. Ephraim is, he's, read St. Ephraim, seriously, it's amazing. St. Ephraim, he, he presents Adam as in being in the middle of the garden. So he presents Adam and Eve as being at the tree of good and evil. That's where they are. So God puts Adam and Eve in the middle of the garden, between the Holy of Holies and the, 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 you know, the, 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 the outer court. Okay? And so, so, so what St. So what Ephraim says, which is amazing, this is an amazing solution to so many problems. Next time you meet a Gnostic, this is the solution to this problem. Okay? So, so, so Ephraim says that 
God put Adam there and told him not to eat the fruit. But he didn't tell him not to eat the fruit because he didn't want him to eat the fruit. He told him not to eat the fruit because he wanted Adam to, to obey. He wanted Adam to be humble regarding that which was above him. He had to, have, he, he had to be in his place in this ontological hierarchy. Right? And St. Ephraim literally says that if Adam had obeyed and not taken the fruit, God would have given him the fruit. God would have given him the fruit so that he could ascend and commune with the tree of life and commune with the glory of God. Right? And so because he took it out of pride, so when he ate the tree of good, he says, when you eat the tree of good and evil, both your eyes open. You could say your right eye and your left eye. The right eye sees the glory of God, and then the left eye sees the, the bottom of the mountain. Right? And so what God wanted was for Adam to, in obedience, receive the fruit so that when he ascended the, he, he ascended the mountain, he would, he would see both sides as well. Right? He would see the lower side and the top side, but he would see it as someone who is healthy understands what sickness is. Whereas now, because he took it out of pride and out of self-sufficiency, the, the opposite happened. Right? He got afraid of this thing up there. He actually was afraid of it. That's why he had to cover himself. He couldn't deal with it. So he had to cover himself, then he falls, and now St. Ephraim says, now he has to learn about wellness from sickness. And it's going to be a long road, my friends. It's going to be a long road. And so the Tower of Babel is the same thing. The Tower of Babel is saying, we're going to reach heaven. We're going to, we're going to build the mountain. We're going to build a mountain. He, God chased us from that mountain. We're going to build a mountain. We're going to go up and we're going to get what's up there. And what's the result? Fragmentation, forgetting, incapacity to commune. All of that, it's the same story. It's actually a good way to understand what the garden is talking about. Because you actually do get this idea of a breaking of communion as they literally go in different directions from this, this, this thing. And they, 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 they can't communicate with each other because they try to take it out of self-sufficiency, out of pride. And that's the, that's the thing. That's why pride is so bad. Because pride is not understanding where you are on this hierarchy. Thinking that you have life in yourself. St. Gregor Nietzsche has this amazing quote. He says, he talks about how sin is, uh, sin is the, the, the capacity for non-being to think that it's being, basically. The capacity for something which doesn't have being in itself to somehow think that they're self-sufficient. And then by doing that, they, they will break apart. You've lost the ultimate thing that joins you together. You've forgotten it. You've forgotten that all of this is connected together, this pyramids, all this this hierarchy up all the way up to the eternal, you know, transcendent God. If you cut that, then things start to break apart because you forget that all of this, all this ontological hierarchy leads up, you know, to our unity in the Logos. And so that's, it, it's, it's this, like I keep telling you, it's a description of reality. It's not arbitrary. This is how things work. I do think so. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The, the, he, he said the, 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 the icon of, of Sinai, the Sinai icon, the famous icon with the two different eyes, where one is kind of looking straight and the other one's kind of looking off, where his left eye is looking off and is, looks a bit angry and his, and his right eye is, is looking straight at you and is, is kind of appeased or calm. Yeah, I think that definitely has to do with this right eye, left eye thing. Um, but it, that's a long story. If you want, I, I gave it, there's a talk on my YouTube channel called um, Sacred Symbol, Sacred Art, where I go into, also my description of the, um, of the icon of the Last Judgment, where I talk about the right hand and the left hand and the right, I mean, I don't use right eye, left eye, but it's like, it's the same, right hand, left hand. Yeah. You could say like, if you think of, of Christ judging the sheep and the goats, he says to those on his right, come, Right? He says to those on his left, move away. So imagine Christ now is the center of this wheel. It's the same. So those that are on the left side, they, they move away and they, they go into fire and forgetfulness and, and they, they, 
they stop being remembering their, but then the, those that are on the right side come into the, to the kingdom. I think it's enough, huh? <laughs> I think it's enough. I, I'm running out of voice is when I know it's enough. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.